Welcome to this talk. My name is Paris. I am a mental health professional. I am an entrepreneur in the mental health sector, as you heard. And uh, I'm also somebody who lives with anxiety and depression myself. What I'm here to talk to you about, as is already mentioned, is about navigating the mental health landscape in this country. But before I do that, I want you to suspend your imagination for a few seconds with me. So imagine that there is this mystery illness which affects approximately 15% of the population of this country. 15% of the population of this country would be 15% of 1.4 billion people, which is a lot of people, right? Now imagine if 15% of these people are affected by a mystery illness and 8 out of 10 people who are affected by this illness are unable to find any kind of help for it. What kind of a situation, what kind of a panic it would create? So it created this panic and people went to the government and said, hey, you need to do something about it. A lot of people have this illness and we don't really have many answers for it. And the government said, sorry, we don't really know what to do over here. We don't even know who the mental health professionals are. We don't even know what kind of help we can provide you. So people are like, no, you got to do something about this. We need some assistance from you. So they're like, fine. I'll just make a couple of hospitals and uh, here's a helpline which you can call whenever you need. I think you should be fine after that, right? And people are like, no, that's not enough. We still need more from you. Um, so the government is like, fine, I'll sanction some money. But in reality, that money is less than what a Shah Rukh Khan film earns at the box office. So people now are like, okay, if the government is not going to help us, we'll go to the next alternative, which is the non-governmental organizations. You go to the non-governmental organizations, they're like, hey, can you help us? And they're like, absolutely, we are here to help you. Your call is important to us. It's just that we are a little backed up right now. Um, we really do want to help you. And as soon as we can help you, we will. But I really don't know what a timeline for that looks like. So now a lot of people are unable to do anything. Some of them who could afford it are like, okay, I'll just pay out of pocket right now. I have insurance. I'll reimburse it later. So they go, they avail the service, they go to the insurance company and the insurance company is like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. We're not going to give you any kind of insurance for it. We don't do that around here, right? Now, if this sounds grim to you, then welcome to mental health in India. As a mental health professional, I often feel like this dog sitting in the middle of a room, everything's on fire. And I have to tell myself, I have to tell my clients, I have to tell everybody that things are going to be okay, but pretty soon I'm going to be on fire as well, right? But I really don't know what to do about it, uh, apart from just telling myself and others that, hey, it's going to be okay. So, I wish I was telling you a fictional story, but this is the reality of what mental health in India is like right now. We are in the midst of an ongoing and has been ongoing for a while mental health pandemic, epidemic, also in India, uh, the government, which usually doesn't really like to acknowledge any statistics, is actually acknowledging that we have the highest rate of suicides in the world. And that Shah Rukh Khan movie budget that I was talking about, our budget in 2023 for mental health at a national level was 990 crores. Jawan made 1,100 crores at the box office, by the way. So that's for perspective for you. In terms of the services, the government has actually funding through this 990 crores. We have two hospitals. One of them is Nimhans in Bangalore. The other is all the way in Tezpur in Assam. And only in 2022 did we start a telemedicine or telemental health helpline. I tried using that once. They told me that it takes 10 days for a professional to get back to me if I require uh, professional services. So that's what the government is running. In terms of if you ask the government, how many psychologists, how many trained and qualified mental health professionals are there in this country, they wouldn't be able to answer that question for you. And that's because there is no register maintained. There is no licensing system in India for mental health professionals as of right now, right? In terms of then what happens is that most services are then provided by private practitioners and non-governmental organizations. When the government isn't subsidizing, when the government isn't providing these services, obviously the burden of that falls on to the end user, which means that mental health services in India are extremely expensive. Insurance only since 2017 has been directed to cover mental illness for inpatient admissions. 
but most mental health care is provided outpatient, which is not covered by insurance. Insurance, in fact, will deny you a health care claim if it was because of a suicide attempt. And the other thing over here is that counseling sessions, psychiatry sessions, which are OPD, will never be covered by insurance in the current form. So as a result, what you see is that if you want to talk to a psychologist, if you want to meet a psychiatrist, an average session, which lasts anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes, can be charged anywhere between 500 to 5,000 rupees. Imagine if you have to pay that once a week, once a fortnight, how much that adds up, right? There isn't a concept of universal mental health care in India. Uh, we say this, we have a policy, but there is no universal mental health care. Forget universal. If you move out of a tier one or a tier two city, there isn't any mental health services available. We have a district mental health program, but as of right now, we don't even know what is the budget that gets sanctioned for it. So we have no idea what the picture is at the village level, at the district level. And the other thing which is most important over here, I spoke about 8 out of 10 people never being able to reach the services that they need. A majority of those 8 out of 10 people are poor, marginalized people who are not located in urban areas. These are the people who need the services the most and they're never going to be able to access these services in the first place. So, I asked myself, can I fix it? Can we do something to fix it? And six years ago, I started an organization which was mentioned when I uh, was introduced. Here are some things that I know now, after six years of running this organization, work and can be part of the answer. Mental health definitely needs to be more affordable. If the sessions and the treatment that we are providing is affordable for an average person earning the salaries that they do, they will utilize those services. The second thing that we realized definitely works is that mental health services which are accessible will be taken up by people. But this means that we have to be able to connect with those people who are not in cities, those who are not speaking English, and we need to reach out to them and connect to them. And the third thing is if mental health services are available in a timely manner, if they're available on demand, people will utilize them. We are not in a position right now to be able to offer them on the same day or maybe even in crisis if somebody requires it. But we should at least aim to resolve somebody's uh, request by 24 to 48 hours. We need to at least start the treatment within 24 to 48 hours, right? That's something that we know that works. But there are still significant challenges which continue and which persist. Mental health comes from the intersection of medicine and psychology. Psychology is a social science, but we see that the way it is taught is very biomedical. However, there is more and more research which says that psychology, mental health is socio-politically determined. However, we are teaching it in a very biomedical manner. The second thing is that psychology as a discipline has been completely designed by a white male and white dead men most of the time, right? We don't know what works in the Indian context. We don't know what works for a person of color because none of these therapies, none of these theories were even developed to work with these populations in the first place. And the third thing is in a country like India, there is very little quality control. There is very little quality check in the absence of registration, licensing, and governing bodies of mental health. So everybody is practicing. Nobody seems to be supervising. I have seen as a professor that people are even averse to feedback after they graduate because there isn't a culture of being accountable. There isn't a culture of training, retraining, continuous upskilling, which exists in the field of mental health, which is a sad reality. So with all of these problems and all of these things that we know, do we really have the answers? Can we do something to make the future of it better? I have some answers which are a yes, and there are some questions which are part of those answers as well. The first thing that is thrown around as a catch-all is technology. And technology definitely has its advantages. Technology definitely has some of the answers. But when we connect people with technology, when we put all of our eggs in that one basket, we are going to exclude the same people who don't have access to technology to begin with. If mental health services are going to be provided largely through technology, 
I don't have access to tech, I'm going to be left out there as well. The second thing, you know, I can't, I, I don't, I can't go to a conference these days without AI being thrown at me every two sentences. And AI definitely has a place in mental health, but I don't know what that place is right now. It's definitely not there yet where it can bridge the treatment gap. I even question whether I want it to, because this is such a personalized human discipline. Do we even want AI to take that place? And the third and most important thing over here, which is a question, is data integrity, data security. I want to tell you a tale about what happened in Finland, which has some of the most robust security measures when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, hackers were able to hack into the data of a mental health organization and were able to access therapy notes of people which had been accumulated over a period of years. And these were people who were blackmailed and harassed so that their notes from therapy sessions were not made public. You can imagine if that's the situation in a Scandinavian country, <clears throat> what would happen in a country like India in the absence of any privacy and data security laws like the HIPAA law, which is there in the, in, in the United States of America. The second thing that I keep hearing about as an answer is startups are going to be the answer, you know? Uh, every season of Shark Tank India has had a mental health uh, organization which has got funded. But are startups the answer? I, I'm asking this as a startup founder myself. Uh, I can definitely tell you one thing, that mental health isn't profitable. And I also question, should it be profitable? Should profit generation be the goal of any mental health startup? It is definitely the goal of a venture capitalist, but when a mental health organization isn't going to be profitable, is VC interest still going to be there? Is it going to be there two years from now, five years from now? History indicates that when something isn't profitable, VC interest migrates away from it as well, right? Um, the second and most important thing that I want to ask over here is not the interests of VCs, but we hear a lot of research about how the existing capitalist structures, the existing economy is a huge contributor to people's mental illness and ill health. Can solutions which are made in these frameworks be the answer to these problems in itself? I'll give you an example for it, uh, you know. Uh, we work with corporate organizations and they pay us to provide mental health services to them. If somebody's coming and talking to me about the uncertainty of their job or the burnout that they're experiencing because of overwork, can I address that through a session that is being paid by the same organization? That's a question that really needs to be answered as well. So startups, I don't think have all of the answers, maybe some of them. What does the government do, right? The government for one has to definitely fund much more, uh, but I think a lot of people's mental health would be much better if they had more money. They would have the answers uh, to their mental health if they were not in debt. We talk about farmer suicides uh, in India, and that I would say is not an issue of mental health, but finances. You talk about student suicides in coaching hubs, in North India and in South India, the answer over there is not a mental health issue. It's a, you know, it's a larger issue about the culture in this country for competitive exams and this mad rat race that we put our children into. So that's something that we definitely need to look at it. The more the government looks at this as an isolated thing, the more we will perpetuate this problem. I think we need to look at the mental health impact of all government policies and make our policies empathetic in such a way that the mental health impact of all of them can be addressed. Even if the government isn't able to subsidize or fund mental health organizations, the least that they can do is not tax them. At present, the government taxes 18% on a therapy session and 10% TDA. So 28% of the revenues that a mental health organization would uh, earn would have to go to taxes. And that's a huge amount because mental health services, a large part of them are not yet under the ambit of medical services. That goes back to the idea that psychologists are largely not recognized as healthcare professionals in this country. Uh, we have insurance programs provided by the government like Ayushman Bharat, but they don't yet consider the services provided by psychologists as things that can be covered or reimbursed under these services. It's a small fix. Other states have done it. Maharashtra, where I have come from, uh, had a scheme like this many years ago where private hospitals were uh, part of a government insurance scheme and they were reimbursed by the government to provide services to the general public. These models need to be replicated in mental health as well. Teaching programs, 
definitely have a big lacuna in the uh, outlook towards mental health, which is outside of the biomedical space. We definitely need to have mental health services and mental health courses which are focusing on the intersectional feminist framework, which means that the sociopolitical determinants of mental health have to be focused on in this sphere as well. We need to recognize that clinical psychology and psychiatry is not the same kind of care which everybody requires. Counseling psychology, art-based therapy, community mental health, these are all things which are required for a full-fledged spectrum of mental health services. As of right now, we don't have the curriculum in place to do that. Uh, we hear of specialized courses which are trauma-informed counseling, queer affirmative counseling, anti-caste therapy. But I ask myself that aren't these basic minimum requirements? What is, what is casteist therapy? What is queer phobic therapy? Right? What is trauma ignorant therapy? Right? Aren't these basic things that we need in therapy to begin with? Right? And the last couple of things that I want to again look at is workplaces have to be mental health sensitive. Mental health is a recognized disability in India, but we don't see any kind of disability quotas uh, being implemented in government or private uh, spaces which are offered to people living with mental illness. We don't see any policies which are preventing discrimination and any kind of uh, you know, harassment of people on the basis of their mental illness. So the same prejudices that exist here exist outside as well. And lastly, I come to you. What can you do? I think firstly, we need to understand that even if all of these problems that I was speaking about were to magically disappear tomorrow, stigma would still mean that people feel ashamed to talk about mental health. So we need to talk more about mental health. We need to have mental health conversations which are not psychology conferences like this. I'm glad we're having this conversation. We need to be better allies. We need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And of course, a lot of people don't just need counseling and services. They require mutual aid, mutual aid for housing expenses, mutual aid for day-to-day -day living expenses. Until we have the answers for that, let's do that. So that's what I had for you. Once again, my name is Paris. I'm a mental health professional. I live in Bangalore with mental illness and this dog, who is my dog. That's my time. Thanks a lot.